the big uh, interest in, in cancer generally, of course, has been in immunotherapy. And an open question right now is, um, is there something going on in, in the microenvironment? Uh, is there something that might be targetable from an uh, immune standpoint? Um, and it is perhaps even interesting to hark back to the, the, the really old days when interferon uh, did seem to have activity against neuroendocrine tumors for reasons that I would say remain somewhat unclear. So we're really looking forward to hearing more uh, from the talks in the next session, and I will turn it over to Dr. Halperin. Thank you, Dr. Kalki. The one thing I have learned after all these years is I'll, I'll never be able to top your introductory statement. So on that note, we'd love to introduce uh, Dr. Mina Kim from Columbia, who's going to talk with us about vascular regulation of liver metastases in pancreatic nets. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Hello, I'm Mina Kim in Columbia University Medical Center. So this is my very first in-person meeting. Um, so I'm very excited and nervous. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about vascular regulation of liver metastasis in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. As you know, these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors frequently develop liver metastasis, where about 40% of patients do have uh, liver metastasis at diagnosis. And we know that, unfortunately, these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are pretty immunosuppressive, limiting the therapeutic efficacy to the current immunotherapies. So we do a uh, study, and also one more thing. So the, this neuroendocrine tumors are, is very uh, vascularized, unlike PDAC. Given the limited numbers of the target therapy to treat patient with liver metastasis, so there is urgent need to identify new th therapeutic targets to control liver metastatic um, disease in the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patient. Uh, in our lab, we focused on uh, targeting tumor vasculature to improve immune suppression and ultimately to control liver metastatic progression in PANEP. So as I said, we, our study focused on angiogenesis, so we uh, check angiogenic factors, which is um, regulated in human pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And we found multiple uh, angiogenic factors, and among them, angioportin 2 was the most significantly unregulated gene in the pancreatic liver metastasis comparing to the normal uh, livers. And the recent study, interestingly, we found that the patient with high angioportin 2 labels in plasma is associated with a poor overall survivor. So what is angioportin 2? So probably uh, you guys are familiar with VEGF, which is the primary angiogenic factor. But angioportin 2 is also angiogenic factor along with VEGF. But angioportin 2 is more important to destabilize blood vessels. In pathologic conditions, so VEGF is produced in tumor cells or other immune cells. But angioportin 2 is stored in endothelial cells, and they are released on, out of endothelial cells upon inflammatory stimuli, and as antagonists, they bind to type 2 and suppress type 2 signaling pathway. And consequently, this unregulation of angioportin 2 promotes vascular leakage by impairing endothelial junction and pericyte detachment. So why vascular leakage is important? The previous study showed that uh, leaky blood vessels can increase interstitial fluid pressure, which can delay drug delivery. But also recent studies emphasize that the leaky blood vessels reduced uh, induce poor vascular perfusion, which impairs immune cell infiltration into the tumor site, and thereby reducing anti-tumor immune response. So as you understand, a lot of recent clinical and preclinical study emphasize the importance of targeting tumor vasculature to enhance the current immunotherapies. So given this, we hypothesized that ends 2 mediated vascular destabilization in liver metastasis can promote metastatic progression by impairing T-cell infiltration into the liver metastasis in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So for study, we have used the uh, RIPTEC mouse model that Doug Hannan developed, and we used the RT2, the hybrid mice model, which have enhanced metastatic potential with improved survivor. So these mice produce more uh, non-functional tumors, and they have 
a more metastasis, so which facilitate our metastasis um, study. And at the same time, we use experimental PetNet metastasis model using the two cell lines from this RT2, original RT2 and hybrid model by injecting them into the tail brain. So as you can see here, this RT2 mice model, the website is healthy liver, so where you can see the almost absent of angioporin 2, but on the right side in the liver metastasis, you can see the nice angioporin 2 unregulation in the region of um, metastatic colony where the type 2 is uh, suppressed in green. And we found this angioporin 2 is unregulated over the disease progression of liver metastasis. So in our study, we have used a selective anti-NG2 antibody by collaborating with Regeneron. And we found that when we block angioporin 2 for two weeks in the late stage of liver metastasis in this RT2 mice, this angioporin 2 blockade dramatically reduced and suppressed liver map burden in this model. And recently, we established this AJ52571 model from this hybrid mice, and we injected this cell line into the tail vein and inhibited angioporin 2 for four weeks. And as you can see in the CT imaging, after four weeks of treatment, we found a significantly suppressed liver map burden after NG2 um, inhibition. And also, recently, we tested the anti metastatic action of angioporin 2 genetic deletion using the endothelial uh, specific angioporin 2 knockout mass model. And then, it consistently in this prevention study, we found angioporin 2 deletion prevented reduced metastatic uh, growth in this model. And consistently, when we prolonged angioporin 2 inhibition in RT2, the spontaneous mouse model, we found the angioporin 2 inhibition improved mouse uh, survivor. And given that we tested vascular stability, because as I said, angioporin 2 is a vascular destabilizing factor. So we first checked the vascular leakage by measuring extravasated plasma protein. And as you can see in the image, after targeting angioporin 2, we found significant reduction of vascular leakage in the liver metastasis. And additionally, uh, we found recently the angioporin 2 inhibition improved and their integrity by increasing parasite coverage, but also improving adherence and tight junctions on endothelial cells. So based on that, we are wondering the association of this angioporin 2 with T-cell infiltration of the, into the liver metastasis. So first, we look at immune cell composition in these mice, and we found about like 5% and 15% of CD8 and CD4 T-cells respectively, which is low population. But also interestingly, when we check the effector T-cells, only like about 20% of CD8 and CD4 T-cells were activated and memory T cell population representing the immunosuppressive nature of this tumor. And interestingly, when we check the association of angioporin 2 levels with the T cell infiltration in liver metastasis, we found the tumors with high angioporin 2 showed poor CD8 and CD4 T cell infiltration. And we can actually see the similar pattern in the human uh, liver metastasis from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patient. So as a functional study, we block angioporin 2 and check the CD8 and CD4 T cell count in the liver metastasis. And as you can see, this angioporin 2 blockade increased the CD8 T cell and CD4 T cell infiltration into the liver metastasis. So currently, uh, we're trying to understand the T cell heterogeneity at the single cell level beyond this study. But also, the, finally, what we did was whether this anti-metastatic effect of angioporin 2 inhibition is dependent on immune component. So we tested angioporin 2, the effect of angioporin 2 inhibition in immunodeficient mice using skid mice lacking T and B cells and using the two cell lines. And in both mouse models, we found this in these immunodeficient mice, we couldn't observe anti-metastatic action of angioporin 2 anymore. And we, when we specifically depleted CD8 and CD4 T cells in this mouse model, if you can see the um, anti-CD8 depletion along with angioporin 2 inhibition, we can see the greater metastasis 
then angiopurine 2 alone anti-NS2 alone treatment, which is compatible to the uh, IgG treated control. And the anti-CD4 treated group, we see the less metastasis compared to anti-CD8, but still greater than angiopurine 2 inhibition alone treatment, suggesting the role of CD4 T cells more like a partial and complementary role in the anti-tumor immune response. So as a conclusion, I hope our study so far convinced you that angiopurine 2 as a potent target to promote immune stimulation by impairing the T cell infiltration. Yeah, thank you so much. And Eunhyang, Sophie, and Alexandra contributed to this work. And we have a wonderful collaborator, Helen and Tiro Foho. The Tiro is here today. And thank you for the all support, especially Net Research uh, Foundation, which really, that, this, that was our first funding, and they made our research initiate and develop. So thank you so much for your listening. Uh, wonderful work. Uh, I noticed that you, you, of course, your model allows uh, development of metastasis, and then you give the anti angiopoietin 2, correct? Yes. Um, have you ever tried giving the angiopoietin 2 when you're delivering the, the cells by vein, by tail vein, <coughs> to see whether you can prevent metastasis? This whole concept of the metastatic niche is something about yeah. the microenvironment that enables tumor cells to seed and grow. Uh, and, and some of those experiments in colon cancer and breast cancer require T cells. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering whether the angiopoietin would, would somehow prevent initial uh, residence in the liver. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's what we are working on. So we wanted to inject this anti-angiopoietin 2 in advance before forming uh, liver metastasis in our model, so to study this prevention study. But that's a really great comment. Thank you. Uh, hi, Suzanne Cossatz uh, from Munich. Um, I think I have a two-part question. Let's see if I can get it all together. Um, so I was wondering, did you also look at the vessel architecture in your models, like within the metastases? Do you see a change from leaky vessels uh, to more intact, or you know, like, or just the size and the number of vessels? Um, so could there also be a correlation to maybe just nutrient um, availability in the tumor in addition to a T-cell component? Mm -hmm. That's one question, and then maybe I ask the second one later. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of treatment, when we compared vascular density before and after treatment, we didn't see the change in vascular density. However, when we look at vascular morphology um, in the liver metastasis itself, as you might notice in our image showing the angiopurin to regulation in the liver metastasis, we found a lot of avascular region, you know, the lack of blood vessels. So probably, you know, the before angiogenic switch, some people suggested vascular co-option and vascular regression, and where angiopurin 2 can be um, involved. So probably some, um, you know, the vascular regression before angiogenic switch can happen in this liver metastasis. Uh, did you in, uh, look at uh, any connection to integrins, integrin signaling? Especially, I was also Googling this on the side because I'm also uh, working with integrins a little bit. And uh, it, I found here that uh, angiopoietin 2 has a connection to integrin alpha 5 beta 1, which is a very important integrin in yes. uh, yes. neoangiogenesis in tumors. So mm -hmm. have you looked at the whole axis together? No, but that's a great question. Yeah, angiopurin 2, because I only explained the type 2 signaling pathway, but angiopurin 2 can also work through the integrin pathway. And we often see the type 2, total type 2 receptor itself is quite low. That made us question about, you know, integrin pathway, but we didn't really look at that yet. A very quick follow-up to that then. So, so VEGF inhibitors have obviously been around a lot. Can you just give us a little bit of background about how angiopotent 2 relates to, to VEGF? Yeah, so including the uh, Dirk Hanan's group, uh, many groups um, have demonstrated the anti-VEGF resistance in the RIPTEC model where they found accelerated liver metastasis when they block VEGF for long term. Um, we kind of 
could recapitulate the same phenotype in the Riptec model when we block VEGF for more than four weeks, we found liver metastasis is increased actually, unlike anti-angioporin 2. So I wonder, this is another project that we recently um, started, whether the angioporin 2 inhibition can overcome the accelerated liver metastasis after anti vegf as one of the folks who is really interested and, and did some work with combination VEGF inhibition and, and checkpoint inhibitors, there were some really interesting data back several years ago about changes in immune trafficking through tumors as a result mm -hmm. of VEGF blockade. And so my, my question is, how will we know that even if the last round of studies wasn't as successful as we'd like, how will we be able to know that, uh, or what can we do to assure ourselves that as we look towards the next round of clinical trials that might involve angiopotent 2, we won't, we won't just be doing the same studies all over again? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, in the blocking angiopotent 2 in the clinical trial, it's quite earlier, early stage compared to the anti vegf and bevacizumab. So the, there's a couple of early clinical trial for anti angioporin 2 along with the checkpoint inhibitor in advanced solid tumors, but I think it's kind of early to say, yeah, thank you. We'll hand off to, uh, to Mara Chiefs, who will uh, talk with us about uh, TILS and ex vivo expansion in uh, liver metastases from endocrine tumors. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mauro Civas, and I am uh, Assistant Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Bari, Aldo Moro, Italy. First of all, let me thank the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to discuss with you guys here in beautiful Boston uh, our work on ex vivo expansion of TILS from uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor liver metastasis in search of uh, novel adopted transfer strategies for the treatment of uh, NETs. These are my disclosures. Multiple forms of uh, adoptive T cell transfer strategies have been investigated so far, spanning from lymphokine-activated killer cells to cytokine-induced killer cells to most recent ones, including TCR-engineered T cells, CAR T cells, as well as tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes. Tumor mutations are a key substrate for the generation of anti-tumor immunity, leading to the development of uh, tumor neoantigens. Once presented by HLA molecules, neoantigens are able to elicit anti-tumor specific immune response. And in particular, uh, tumor neoantigen reactive T cells have been detected across multiple malignancies and they can be identified, expanded in vitro, and then reinfused back into the patients uh, at Pacti Weupan. Polyclonal TILs have been uh, already shown to exert anti-tumor activity uh, in patients with uh, metastatic colorectal cancer. And there is recent evidence presented at ESMO in Paris a couple of months ago showing that in the context of a phase three clinical trial, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are able to prolong progression for survival compared with single agent immunotherapy with ipilimumab in patients with uh, advanced melanoma. And when you look at these curves from a purely oncologic standpoint, you're not just impressed by the difference between the red curve tails and the blue curve epilimumab, but also by the fact that you have a tail persisting there in the red curve. That means that at least theoretically, there, there is a certain, a certain percentage of patients that are cured by this therapy. Even more intriguingly, there is a very recent evidence coming from uh, NIH that not only bulky lymphocytes, but in particular neontigen reactive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes can be affected in treating solid neoplasms. And here there is a work uh, showing the effectiveness of this treatment against breast cancer. Prior research from our group demonstrated that the majority of pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms are characterized by a limited neontigen load. Although there is a small proportion of pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms that can have a high neontigen load, and that correlates with extra pancreatic spread, grade two, and uh, high T. In particular, a linear relationship could be seen between neontigen load and CD4 infiltration, as well as neontigen load and dendritic cell infiltration. On this basis, and thanks to a grant from the Net Research Foundation, we started in uh, March 2022 
a new project aimed at identifying and expanding for therapeutic purposes tumor neoantigen reactive T-cells for the treatment of uh, pancreatic neuron tumors. We enrolled patients with uh, G1, G2 pancreatic neuroendocrineoblasms metastatic to the liver. Any line of therapy uh, was fine, so any prior therapy was, was allowed. And fresh or cryopreserved samples of panet liver metastasis and had to be available. Uh, in particular, at least 10 fragments of approximately 3 cubic millimeter each. That means that we couldn't use biopsies, basically, but only surgical specimens. So far, we have enrolled 13 patients uh, into the study, and we analyzed 13 patients so far. And in particular, TILS could be successfully grown from 11 out of 13 samples, meaning that the failure rate was approximately 15%. We could not detect any difference in terms of in T-cell CLD uh, by tumor grade, Ki67, vascular perineural invasion, nor prior therapy, whereas we observed a huge spatial heterogeneity, meaning that you could have a completely different T-cell yield using a fragment that was neighboring another fragment. So fragments that were like really close within the tumor could give us a completely different tumor yield, although they were plated in the same identical conditions. In this first phase, we compared different expansion protocols, uh, in particular tissue enzymatic digestion versus in vitro culture of wall fragments, so-called microcultures, early CD3 enrichment versus late CD3 enrichment versus no enrichment whatsoever, low interleukin-2, high interleukin-2 versus interleukin-7, uh, 15. And what is shown there <laughs> is that basically, uh, for sure, the microcultures worked much better as compared with the tissue enzymatic digestion. Uh, and you cannot see barely the um, black line because like, it approaches the x-axis. Uh, that was like the one with the tissue enzymatic digestion. No enrichment uh, whatsoever worked better than uh, any kind of CD3 enrichment. And in particular, you can see that uh, in fresh tumors, interleukin-2 seem to work a little bit better uh, than uh, interleukin-7-15, whereas in uh, cryopreserved tumors, interleukin-7-15, for some reasons, worked a little bit better than uh, interleukin-2. But like overall, the main message on this slide is that uh, cryopreservation has a major impact on the T-cell yield. You can see that like, uh, uh, we had an average of uh, 350 millions of T-cells coming from fresh tumors and an average of approximately 2 millions of uh, T-cells coming from cryopreserved tumors. Anyhow, that means that we have adequate number to start the rapid expansion phase so we can approach the clinical testing of these products. What are the cell populations growing in uh, T-cell cultures? So, as expected, mostly T cells, although there is a percentage compressed between 5 and 10 percent of NK cells and NK T cells. What are the T sets growing in T cultures? And uh, CD4 positive T cells uh, were absolutely prevalent and uh, they exceeded uh, CD8 positive T cells uh, at a median uh, ratio of 8 to 1. What about Treg? Uh, we were really interested in this, and in particular, we wanted to understand if the percentage of Treg could increase over time during extended uh, in vitro culture. With interleukin-2, that didn't happen. Uh, for some reasons, we saw that a little bit more with uh, interleukin-7-15. But overall, I would say that uh, uh, for CD4-positive Treg, we saw a percentage comprised between 10 and 20%. For CD8-positive Treg, the percentage was comprised between 5 and 10% of the whole bulk of the tails. Differentiation. We wanted to assess the differentiation status uh, over time during uh, our in vitro culture. And you can see here that uh, the differentiation status was quite stable, constant over time uh, in the CD4 positive population, whereas there was a striking uh, difference, um, something like happened between like day seven and day fourteen, in terms of differentiation. Basically, we observe we did not observe any uh, effector cells after seven days from the plating of our lymphocytes. Thus, meaning that all these T cells underwent apopt apoptosis, possibly driven by interleukin two or interleukin seven fifteen. Obviously, that can relate to a skewing of the TCR repertoire. Immune checkpoints. 
So we evaluated the expression of uh, several immune checkpoints on our tilts, and consistent with the uh, uh, available literature, the expression of PD-1 was very low. Whereas, strikingly, we found a very high expression of uh, CD39 and TGIT, and in particular, that expression tended to increase over time. To conclude, TILS can be successfully expanded from pan-net liver metastasis with a failure rate of approximately 15%. While cryopreservation has a strong impact on the T-cell yield, the number of T-cells expanded from pan-net liver metastasis is still adequate for the subsequent rep when both fresh and cryopreserved samples are used. Microcultures of pan-net liver metastasis outperform other expansion methods and should be preferred to optimize the T-cell yield. The differentiation of T cells changes over time during extended in vitro culture, and obviously that may relate the, to uh, TCR repertoire skewing. Tilts expanded from pan-net liver metastasis are characterized by high levels of expression of TGIT and CD39, and one may wonder if there is any role for TGIT or CD39 inhibition alone or in combination with tail transfer in patients with NETs. With that, I would like to thank our funders, in particular Net Research Foundation, that made this, po this project possible. I would like to thank our collaborators, Dr. Jonathan Strasberg at Moffitt Cancer Center, Dr. Adira Gualiri at the uh, Instituto Oncologico di Bari, Dr. Ilaria Marinoni at the uh, University of Bern, Dr. Angurai Sadanamandan at the uh, Institute of Cancer Research, London, and in particular I would like to thank Nada Chaul, who is carrying out primarily this work. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. You uh, did have the TRAC, and uh, for all those patients, uh, but uh, what's the ratio of the TRAC compared to peripheral blood of the, 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 the patient, almost? So second is, uh, are you uh, planning to isolate uh, the TCR and uh, its target in the near future? Yeah, yeah, that's what we want to do. I mean, that's, a, that's exactly the point where we want to get. So like our idea is to be able to uh, isolate the TILs that specifically express a TCR targeting a specific new antigen. Uh, so like we want to implement, you know, like we want to put together our bioinformatic pipeline for the identification of new antigens with this work here to identify and then expand exactly that population. Tireg, tireg and peripheral blood. Well, for the Treg, uh, like we are also working on that. Like uh, now we are comparing that with the peripheral blood, um, and like for that, like we have another idea. We are trying like several strategies to deplete Treg in our uh, culture. Also to understand if by depleting the Treg, you can also boost the proliferation of the remaining T cells. Chrissy, Rexter. Um, and it really, really, it's really, really interesting work. You know, as a community, we wouldn't have expected much because the neoantigen expression was quite low. In terms of including patients that have had prior treatment, do you think maybe patients who've had chemotherapy or PRT might bump up the neoantigen load and help you? I know that might change the signal, but do you think by specifically selecting those or of the patients you've looked at, are there any with chemo or PRT that might have? Something different. Mm -hmm. I mean, like to the best of my knowledge, there is no evidence so far that in the patients that are treated with chemo or with the PRT, you get a higher degree of infiltration by immune cells. Uh, theoretically, you can expect that because theoretically you would expect an increase of the mutational load and as a consequence of the new antigen burden, but that's not necessarily going to happen. So, I mean, like so far, I don't think that there is the, uh, definite evidence on that. Um, but I can tell you that, like, obviously here the numbers are low. Uh, we started a few months ago. But I can tell you that, like, so far there is no difference whatsoever by prior therapies. So we, that, we tried to do that, and there is no difference in patients who got already chemo or PRT and those who got just somatostatin analogs. So, so far, like, the answer would be no, we don't see that. Yeah. So our, our next speaker is uh, Zinzin Hua. Um, who will be telling us about early studies on the potential for CAR-T therapy in neuroendocrine tumors, a, a very hot field. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Xianxin Hua. I'm a professor of cancer biology at the University of Pennsylvania. 
uh, today. I'm uh, very uh, happy to have this opportunity to, uh, to share with you some recent progress on further uh, analyzing the third generation uh, CD17 CAR T's, uh, which can eliminate NADS and uh, uh, GI solid tumor. And uh, general, the, the result is it uh, actually uh, activate uh, uh, enhancing multiple uh, T cell uh, signaling pathway. Uh, I want to mention this is a, a work in progress. Uh, this uh, is all uh, the, the majority data is uh, unpublished. So still a lot of work to be to be done. This is my disclosure slide. So uh, last year uh, in the virtual setting of the meeting, so uh, I dis described the CD17 CAR-T, uh, the non-body uh, non redirected CAR-T cell can eliminate uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, since then, the paper just describing this work just published uh, in May issue of Nature Cancer, actually, we were very happy they featured this on the cover. And uh, also, uh, this related work uh, is uh, now licensed by uh, University of Pennsylvania to, uh, to a company to uh, further uh, clinical trial. And uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Yi, is also here in the meeting, and uh, I and others will continue to push this uh, to clinical study. So. Today, what I'm going to talk is uh, to follow the previous work uh, uh, just published, uh, which described the second generation CAR T as a top diag diagram, and the third generation, at the top of second generation, increasing this uh, CD28 intracellular domain uh, green color. So these two CAR T, when injected in mice, as you see in the panel C, is, uh, uh, so control tumor grow e exponentially. The second generation CAR T uh, show in the red line can suppress tumor, but uh, not irradiate. And the third generation CAR T, re represented by the green line, can eradicate the tumor. And the histology study clearly show the control tumor injected by the control T cell, uh, screen as green on the top of uh, in the image. There's no red screen uh, T, uh, T cell. The tumor from second generation car injected, the green tumor uh, size reduced, but the T cell infiltration increased. The bottom one remarkably showing the T cell completely got rid of the green tumor cell and uh, fill the tumor side with the red T cell. So the question is why the third generation CD17 car T is much more potent than the second generation car. The second question is, uh, uh, what can we learn from the uh, pathway regulated by third generation CAR-T, uh, whether we can use some of this knowledge to further improve net therapy. So for the people who are not familiar with the, the single cell uh, RNA seq analysis, just diagramming briefly illustrate the process. So we use the T cell from the tumor isolated from the, the mice uh, injected with second generation CAR or third generation CAR and then isolate this single uh, T cell by flow cytometry sorting and then subject it to the drop sequence analysis. So basically each single cell can be used to generate a library. And uh, this next gene sequence is uh, aligned and uh, annotated. So here I just want to show you the results. Uh, this is in collaboration with my colleague uh, Noam uh, Slender, assistant professor at the Vista Institute and also at the Department of Cancer Biology. Uh, here, that's uh, uh, the first batch of results. The bioinformatics synthesis show that uh, the third generation CAR T is uh, here at 28 BBZ, uh, have a much uh, increased percentage of TH17 uh, cell, especially uh, normalized by the TH1 cell. And uh, these uh, and the normalized uh, one you can see the, from the diagram is uh, like almost 25 percent. So these data actually is very consistent with the uh, earlier paper published by my colleague Carl Jung. So uh, his lab show I cost based uh, chimeric uh, CAR T cell and uh, have uh, increased TH17 and show much. Uh, uh, higher anti-tumor activity. So this is the real work in the progress. We need to isolate the subpopulation to further test this uh, concrete uh, function towards the cancer cell. 
And also further analysis show this uh, gamma delta like T cell is uh, because this T cell still have T uh, cell receptor. And as you can see, the much higher population in the third generation CAR T cell. And also, uh, third generation CAR T cell in this population, uh, population show much uh, enhanced. Uh, Granzyme uh, B and uh, granzyme K expression, that's the killer enzyme to the target, and also the interferon 17 receptor. So, further uh, analysis show this, uh, as I just mentioned, cytolytic enzyme granzyme B is much increased. And to further increase understanding of the, uh, the total okay, population's uh, behavior in, uh, in the third generation car, we also perform the bulk RNA seq analysis uh, of the second and third generation uh, CAR T cell when they're facing the target cell or the control cell. So the results show that uh, uh, consistent with single cell analysis, uh, the TH17 lineages, uh, okay, immune response uh, signature also uh, increased. And uh, in addition, this bulk RNA sequence analysis is showing that uh, T cell in the third generation CAR T uh, shown left, uh, the T cell activation pathway is uh, highly upregulated. In contrast, uh, in the second generation CAR T cell, it's more like a responsive gene to cytokine stimulation is increased, and also some apoptotic process related gene got upregulated, showing the third generation gain much uh, more survived pathway. So also consistent uh, with the Previous data, uh, our third generation CAR T have the CD28 uh, domain. So these uh, sequences also show the uh, enhanced CD28 signaling. Uh, so in summary, we show that uh, the third generation CAR have several cell lineage change, and some I even didn't have time uh, to talk about the so TH17 NK cell, gamma delta, and the CD8 central memory cell. And uh, in the signaling pathway for the third generation CAR T, have TH17 and TC at activation domain and the granzyme domain are regulated. But the uh, T cell response apoptosis pathway is down regulated, which is up regulated in the second generation CAR T. So uh, that's the summary. And the future work, we still need to determine which uh, of the subtype CAR T cell upregulated by third generation car really works better ex vivo when isolated pure or in vivo and uh, whether we can use ectopic express some uh, key master gene can further enhance the third generation car T's function. So before I end, I want to thank the people who make a great contribution to this recent progress, uh, Jay Feng and uh, Xin He, and uh, they actually did a lot of work and assisted by uh, many others in the lab, and also my colleague Noam uh, Lancelot did a fabulous work on the bioinformatic analysis, and uh, my colleague uh, uh, Kao Jung and others. Uh, and uh, I would be a bigger remiss if I have not uh, mentioned the funding by Neuroendocrine Foundation, which uh, is uh, provided the absolutely essential fuel to move the project. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Two questions. One, what's the percentage of neuroendocrine tumors that have CD17? Second, is your third generation CAR T ready to go? Is that, what you, is that why you brought up Jennifer? <laughs> Yeah so, yeah, so it's a good question. And uh, the percentage one uh, in terms of pancreatic or endocrine tumor is about 40 to 60%. And that's a, a heterogeneity cover range from like 90% above or expressed on the cell surface. Some actually have like 50% in the positive. Uh, but what is more impressive is for GINS. GINS almost like 100%, okay, in some reports and in our hands as well, have the uh, CD17 expression. And uh, also they express in the cell surface, but in the intensity is polarized in our animal model, which the CAR T cell also can recognize, cannot damage it. In our hands, that work. Second, in the clinical study, yeah, so where's my colleague? Some colleague here. So we talk a lot, definitely, uh, discuss a lot how to actually uh, accelerate pre uh, process, but this uh, 
is uh, far more than what we usually do because you need a lot of people coordinated like a team and it's very specialized. So it's kind of a different domain. Based on this data that you just showed us, uh, do you think that uh, transducing gamma delta T cells might land better results as compared with alpha beta? Uh, or can you use that as a control for your organic? This gamma delta recall is not a classic one. We particularly dive deeper to see whether this gamma delta have the TCR, and they turned out also have regular alpha beta, so it's not a very conventional. So this definitely express car. We we are uh, isolate this gamma delta, and you have very good uh, uh, yeah good thought on that to further yeah test that in vitro in vitro could uh, I mean it could and it could not have that because we also have NK uh, NKT cell. Hi, Martin Captain London. Uh, fantastic uh, work. Following on from Chrissy's thought process this morning about uh, the microbiome, the exciting area, I'm totally ignorant in it, but the exciting area is, is the microbiome and immunotherapies, CAR T cells, and you even see animals which have been non-responsive, but you could take the responsive fecal microbiome, transfer it into the uh, responsive animals, and you see um, enhanced response. Have you, is that part of your thought process in terms of trying to enhance your process? You're, you've got the animal models there. Is that something you would think about doing? Is it uh, worthwhile? Yeah, I think it's a very good point. And uh, the microbiome, we all know, is increasingly become more popular, important uh, effect, uh, like uh, so many functions, di like diabetes, obesity, and the tumor. There's many reports. And uh, uh, is uh, I talked to some of my co uh, colleagues. They definitely are interested. Uh, they doing the diet uh, and microbiome. That's uh, yeah, very. Uh, that's a very good point. We definitely would like love to yeah to to look into that. Thank you. Next up, it's our pleasure to welcome Professor Don Quell from Iowa, who's going to talk with us about CDK46 and MEC uh, dual targeted therapy. Uh, for pink radicular infant tumor models. Thanks, everybody. I'm happy to tell you about this uh, new-ish kind of combination therapy that we think can be very valuable for pancreatic nets and possibly other types of nets. So we, we know that nets are clinically challenging. They don't grow very quickly. They aren't very responsive to conventional therapies. And we do need to understand more about their genetics, their different pathways that are activated. And uh, my group is focused mainly on the pancreas. And so while there are a number of excellent therapies that we can use for these patients targeting somatostatin receptors, AKT mTOR signaling, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, uh, we do know that for those patients who have unresected or unresectable disease, that they will inevitably progress. And so we really do need to understand and identify new targets and uh, therapies to treat these resistant tumors. And we're hearing about all of these different ideas at this meeting. So what is our rationale for focusing on targeting uh, cyclin-dependent kinases 4 and 6 and MET kinases? Because you can see from this little cartoon of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor cell, there are a lot of dysregulated pathways. So one reason is that it was shown over 10 years ago that most patient tumors have upregulation of CDK4 and 6. Also, there is a correlation between loss of the CDK4-6 inhibitor, P16, with poor prognosis in the patients. Also, we and others have found that upstream regulators of CDK4 and 6, which includes a GTPAs we study, RAPL6A, and MEC itself, are upregulated in patient PNETs and in the tumor cells. And then we've done kinome studies recently where we've found that there are really just about 15 or so kinases that are significantly upregulated in growing peanuts, and CDK6 is one of them. Uh, so we've conducted similar phosphoproteome analyses, and you can see that in the pink, these are all the activated kinases, and in the blue are the tumor suppressors that are lost um, and inactivated in these tumor cells. So again, we're focusing on MEC and CDK4 and 6. And when we think about targeting these kinases, we know that monotherapies 
in general, for most targets, are not going to yield sustainable effects. You're going to develop resistance rather quickly. So what about combining them? And so that's what we felt was that we would achieve synergistic activity if we combine both of them. And this really builds off some seminal studies from Scott Lowe's group, where he had documented using specific inhibitors of CDK4 and 6, palbociclib is one of those drugs, as well as drugs targeting MEK. They use trametinib, we use mirtametinib. When you use them together, you synergistically reactivate the retinoblastoma or RB1 tumor suppressor. And that will lead to an induction of cellular senescence, which can be good or bad, but if it elicits a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, they were suggesting that led to the infiltration of natural killer cells or CD8-positive T cells into the tumors. And it depended on the tumor context. One was for lung tumors, the other was for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So we looked at the synergy between these drugs using BON and QGP1 PNET cell lines. We're just showing the BON one here. And we see beautiful synergy shown in the, the red bar for the combination compared to the individual drugs that are shown in the gray bars. And that's for cell cycle arrest, as well as for the induction of cell death. And we wanted to correlate that with molecular activation of RB, which is shown by the fact that it it becomes hypo or under phosphorylated. So that was good. We moved, we did some other in vitro studies, but I'll just show you what our, our results were when we moved in vivo using bond xenografts. And uh, you can immediately see that the combination therapy shown in red gives you prolonged tumor suppression. And we, we stopped it there at about 85 uh, for about a week. And then some of the mice we let go again without any drug. Those are in blue. And those that we put back on drug are in red. And you can see that it did help to add the drug again. But in general, the resistant tumors grew pretty quickly at that point. So at no point were we able to achieve tumor regression. And eventually, every single tumor uh, became resistant. So we also used an in vivo metastasis model where Courtney Kemmer in my lab had generated some luciferase expressing BON1 and QGP1 cells so that they're now called LUC. Uh, you can inject them into the arterial system, intracardiac, or in the tail vein. And this shows what happens with tail vein injections so that you can do non-invasive imaging of the tumors over time. And when we use that model, you can see in the pink curve on the left that the combination is better than any of the other therapies. We're not quite significantly different than mirtametinib, but we were trending in that direction. And that's shown in that mouse below at weeks four through seven, that we really had little tumor growth. But more importantly, we actually reduced the number of colonized sites in those animals. And that was more impressive than actually suppressing the rate of tumor growth. So we really wanted to get into an immune competent model. And so our next speaker is Ji Zhang Wan from Rutgers is going to tell you more about uh, some of their studies. But we collaborated with them because uh, they've generated not only MEN1 knockouts, but also MEN1 P10 double knockouts. And you can see that there's a lot of CDK4 to target in these tumors. Um, and these mice will develop de novo insulinomas at about five to six months of age. And so uh, Zhijiang uh, treated them for two weeks with drugs, either vehicle, MEK, or CDK4 inhibitors alone, or the combination. And then four weeks later, harvested tumors. And on the left, you can see the H&E showing that there are significantly smaller tumors or islet tumors uh, with the combination compared to either drug alone. And the little bubble on the right-hand side is the quantification to show that the combination is actually significantly better at causing tumor regression than palbociclib or metinib alone. Uh, with that dramatic tumor regression, and based on the prior papers, we're potentially expecting to see an infiltration of natural killer cells or T cells. But we also had another sarcoma model, and we also, in that model, saw infiltration of B and plasma cells. And in this model, we also saw a significant infiltration of CD19 positive B cells and or plasma cells. We can't distinguish based on that stain. And an increase in antigen-presenting dendritic cells. 
And in fact, there were trends for increased T cells and natural killer cells, but nothing significant because our, our animal number is low. So we were excited by this because there are a lot of papers in the last couple of years that are showing that B cells or plasma cells, and perhaps plasma cells more so, connote better patient survival if the tumors contain them, that they are required for, potentially, to lead to the formation of tertiary lymphoid structures, or TLSs, uh, that contain activated T cells and dendritic cells. And that uh, in patients who have B or plasma cells in their tumors, they respond better to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies, whether to PD-1 or PDL one So we speculated that our CDK4-6 targeted therapy would sensitize the peanuts to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And I'll tell you that we worked with anti pdl one antibodies because CDK4 and 6 regulate the expression of that on the tumor cells. And when you use the inhibitor, pdl one levels go up on the tumor cells. So in fact, Zhijiang did this experiment, and it's beautiful. Uh, when you uh, look at the combination shown in the blue curve, it shows you that you're getting a beautiful regression of the tumors that were treated for just four weeks. And that's shown by the serum insulin levels dropping dramatically, as well as the measurement of the tumor size. And you can see the comparison. You get intermediate effects with palbociclib alone, and interestingly, a fairly good effect with anti pdl one alone. So what I've shown you at this point is that uh, this combination synergistically suppresses peanuts, both in vitro and in vivo, that the inhibition, if we use it in immune-competent mouse models, induces a unique B and plasma cell signature, as well as dendritic cell accumulation, and that it sensitizes those tumors to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, our future studies, we really need to get more numbers for our animal studies. So we're expanding those, hopefully get better stats on our flow cytometric data. And we do want to actually do multiplex immunohistochemistry. We want to quantify the TLSs, and we want to evaluate their maturation status. Are they early? Are they actually fully mature and containing plasma cells? We want to do similar studies in the non-functional peanuts that, that James mentioned this morning using his syngeneic allograph model. And then we want to test the importance of B or plasma cells by using mice that lack them and seeing whether or not the tumors and their response to drug is affected. And so uh, these are pilot studies that Zhijiang has, has conducted. And you'll see that with the combination of the palbociclib and anti pdl one we are seeing a trend toward increased plasma blasts in these tumors. And surprisingly, in the gray bar, the CDK4-6 inhibitor alone is leading to an increase. We also see a trend toward increasing dendritic cells. Notably, we do not see any increases in T cell numbers. If anything, they go down with the combination. I'm, I'm interested to see if what we get is a reorganization of the T cells. So it's not a change in number, but it's a, an aggregation or clustering of them into TLSs. So that's one thing that we'll be looking at. We are working with a variety of companies, but with the Oregon Health and Sciences uh, University Knight Cancer Institute, they do 23 marker panels on a single slide of tissue with iterative rounds of antibody staining, imaging, and destaining. And we're getting some really nice data where we can look at immune cell composition in the tumors. We can correlate that with survival of the mice or the patients with TLS number and composition. And we did it on two of the patient tumors, one where we had a really old FFPE uh, slide and another where it was very fresh. And in both of them, we're getting nice staining results uh, showing B cells. And what we want to do in the future is actually look at plasma cells, et cetera, and correlate that with all of the other immune cells that are present within the tumors. And with that, I want to thank the entire group. I will point out two people in my group, Courtney and Salma, uh, who did the bulk of what I showed you, and then Zhijiang uh, and Ned and Steve Labuti from Rutgers for their tremendous immune-competent model. So a few weeks ago, we looked at that, uh, at least for the GI tract. And what we found is that, uh, particularly, uh, glodinal nets uh, seem to harbor tertiary lymphoid structures. Uh, what type of nets? Glodinal. However, like, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors have not shown that much benefit in that specific population. So my answer, my comment is, 
are you sure that this research that you just showed us are really related to any changes in uh, tertiary yeah. infrastructures? That's a perfect question, and that is one of our questions in a grant proposal that we've written because it's, un it's unclear. I mean, are they really important or are they not? Um, and are plasma cells or B cells needed for that or are they not? There was one pr very nice study in ovarian cancer where they got rid of B cells and they had absolutely no response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy anymore. And that's a preclinical mouse model, but it was very informative and suggests that they may be important. But maybe the context is also important, and maybe there's a suppressive environment, and maybe you have too many M2 macrophages, or you know whatever it might be. And I think the composition of those TLSs are they are they really mature? Do they have the dendritic cells? Do they have everything that is needed to enhance the anti-tumor immune response? Great thought. Really, really beautiful work, Dawn. Thank you. I'm playing devil's advocate here. Do you think you've got enough information to be confident to just go straight into a clinical trial? And that, you know, there's early phase studies yes. going on, you know, using these drugs in combination. And it's well, just putting it out there. Yes, and that was our third aim for our proposal, is to do a window of opportunity trial. We can't quite jump into phase one. But what we were going to do is, is take patients uh, who are scheduled for surgery give them a course of a couple weeks of CDK4-6 inhibitor as well as anti-PDL1 because Genentech said they'd provide it. Um, and then uh, after that treatment, they'll undergo surgery and we'll actually evaluate are we seeing these, these changes in the immune environment and would that give us a good uh, justification to move on to like phase one and two trials. Thank you. One, there was one question in the chat as well that just came out. Um, what, it, what is known about the potential PK interactions between these drugs, and is that a potential concern? Uh, I guess it would be a reason to do a phase one. Yeah, I think so. I don't think that there's any concern about PK interactions. Um, there are some, some early trials that are going on in breast cancer, um, and so far as I know, there are no issues with it, but it's a really important question. Okay, thank you. Our, our next speaker has already been partially introduced. We've seen some of the work, uh, Dr. Um, Zhizheng Wan, um, who will be um, speaking to us about the role of the B7X signaling pathway in neuroendocrine tumors uh, and joined on, online by um, Dr. Steve Lavuti as yeah. well. So this project is uh, supported by the um, Neuroendocrine Research Foundation. Uh, today, um, of my title, the title of my presentation is the role of the B7X signaling pathway in the development and progression of the pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. So the B7 family and their receptor, the CD28 families, are the major immune checkpoint, the regulation T-cell activation, which make the pathway very attractive targets, such as uh, PD-1 and pd one We have discovered a new immune checkpoint protein, B7X, which is uh, involving in enhancing cancer uh, development and progression by inhibiting T cell immune functions. So, use our human tissue band, we demonstrate that B7X is a uh, upregulation in 60% of the human PNET tissues. They also have a stronger correlation with stage. In the stage 1, it's a 50%, and stage 2, is a 57%, and stage 3, is a 75%, and uh, stage 4, is a 100%. We also demonstrate there is a significant correlation between the B7X expression with uh, tumor size and tumor cell population by KI67 staining. So we also develop an uh, MEM knockout mouse model. This mouse model can develop an insonoma at 10 to 12 months, and insonoma as a biomarker can monitor tumor growth. And we also use this mouse model can identify that uh, B7S upregulation in the MEM1 tumor, uh, but not in the normal pancreas. So to assess the role of the immune checkpoint B7S activation on PNET tumors, we generate MEM1 and B7X double knockout mice by cross crossing MEM1 single knockout mice and B7S single knockout mice. 
in panel A, we can see the insulin is a significant decrease in the MEM1B7X double knockout mice compared to MEM1 single knockout mice. And panel B, we also identified that tumor size is significant decrease in the MEM1B7X double knockout mice to compare the MEM1 single knockout mice. So use a flow assay, we also demonstrate loss of the B7X in the pancreas island of the MEM1 double knockout mice increased T cell infiltration and NK cell perforation. So to investigate whether the targeting of the B7S can modify tumor microenvironment and inhibit tumor growth, we generate a B7S antibody. And we treat the mice with this antibody and IgG control uh, in panel A. We demonstrate uh, insulin significant decrease in the B7S antibody compared to the IgG control. In panel B, we demonstrate improved survival in the BC1X antibody tumor group compared to the IgG control group. So this is a, a historical assay. We can see the um, tumor size is significant decrease in the B7X antibody tumor group compared to the IgG control group. Use the flow assays, we also demonstrate T cell infiltration in the B7X antibody tumor group compared to the IgG control group. So in the floor, we demonstrate loss of the B7X can inhibit the tumor growth. So we want to understand what driver the B7X articulation in the tumor genesis. So some literature has report HIF1 alpha can cause the articulation of a PDL1. And the HIF1 alpha can also bind to the PDL1 promoter. So a number of the Study also showed a regulation of a HIF1 alpha in the pancreas new ending tumor. So maybe we thinking HIF1 alpha is a driver to B7X articulation. So use our the mouse model, we demonstrate HIF1 alpha and B7X is a regulation when the islet cell perforation from the six months and the 12 months of the our MEM knockout mouse. So we also use the uh, mouse uh, beta cell model. We demonstrate HIF1 alpha regulation b 7 expression under hypoxia condition in panel A. When the cell culture under the hypoxia condition, the HIF1 alpha and b 7 induce expression. Uh, but uh, we treat cell light with the HIF1 alpha. XRNA, we don't see the HIF1 alpha and b 7 regulation. We also use the B7S promoter lucifer assay. We demonstrate the, the cell line uh, under the hypoxic condition, the B7S promoter activation. So we also use the chip PCR assay. We demonstrate that HIF1 alpha also can bind the uh, B7S promoter in M134 beta cell under hypoxic condition and MEM1 tumor tissue of the MEM1 knockout mice. So we also want to understand uh, loss of the HIF-1 inhibitor B7S articulation and induce the T cell activation in the either cell of the, our the, uh, MEM1 HIF double knockout mouse model. We generate the uh, MEM1 HIF-1 alpha double knockout mice by crossing MEM1 single knockout mice and HIF-1 alpha single knockout mice. We also can see the B7S down regulation in the MEM1 HIF1 alpha double knockout mice compared to MEM1 single knockout mice. We also demonstrate immune cell populations increase in the MEM1 knockout HIF1 alpha double knockout mice compared to MEM1 single knockout mice. So use the uh, ELISA assay, we also demonstrate insulin is a significant decrease in the MEM1 HIF1 alpha double knockout mice compared to the MEM1 single mice. And panel D use a histological assays. We also demonstrate tumor sizes significant decrease in the MEM1 HIF1 double knockout mice compared to the MEM1 single knockout mice. So in summary, we have a damage that B7X was the always present in the human penis and also correlated with the clinical 
pathological catalyst. We also demonstrate MEM1B7X double knockout mice shows an decrease uh, uh, either cell population and tumor transformation associated with the T cell infiltration. So B7X may be an important regulator of the tumor immunity in the tumor microenvironment of a penis. We also generate a high affinity B7X antibody targeting the B7X and blocking of the B7X with the antibody inhibit the penis. Can the cell perforation by increase the T cell infiltration. This wall maybe provides an important insight that can rapidly translate it to the candidate by the targeting of the B7X for the treatment of the patient with the penis. We have a demonstrated HIF1 alpha can bind to the B7X promoter and HIF1 alpha can induce B7X regulation under hypoxic condition. This suggests the potential molecular mechanism of the B7X regulation is uh, due to the expression of the HIF1 alpha following uh, related hypoxia resulting from the rapid uh, growth of the tumor cell. So this project is supported by the New End Tumor Research Foundation. And I am happy to answer any questions. So in compared to other like uh, GINS or other type of normal uh, or a tumor, but this is uh, just a very strictly expressed net or other type of normal cell as well. So that's question one. Second, uh, also I'm just uh, recalling the, this morning very uh, stimulating discussion about the, the role of genomics uh, or RNA genomics uh, to identify potential uh, marker gene. So I just, uh, for general uh, speaker uh, in the morning, whether this B7X was uh, really high in the uh, in the profiling or maybe it's a relatively uh, low level expression uh, operatively. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but um, our the tumor tissue band most part is the pancreas nucleus tumor. And maybe next step we will uh, do more the uh, GI new endocrine tumor, uh, see how about the b 7 ex expression. And um, maybe the, our, uh, our the cooperation group, they have a lot of the spot, uh, uh, spot, small about the GI tumor. So maybe we can screen the more, uh, uh, the, another kind of the new endocrine tumor and see how about the p 7 x expression frequency. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuan. We'll, we'll move on to group discussion. Please come on up and have a seat. I want to thank you for letting me uh, join you virtually. I just wanted to answer that last question a little bit. Um, I think Zhu Zhang did an excellent job with the presentation. B7X, as some of you may know, that are checkpoint files is uh, notable because of its um, very specific expression in tumor tissue. You know, the big downside to PD-1 and PDL one is there's a fair amount of expression in normal tissue, so we get off-target toxicity. B7X does not suffer from that uh, issue. Uh, it's uh, almost exclusively expressed in tumor tissue as opposed to normal. And understanding why that is, is actually part of the interesting science around this checkpoint protein. We did look at GI nets. We have a wonderful collaboration with Dawn and her colleagues at the University of Iowa. And Jim Howe, uh, who many of you know, has an amazing tumor bank uh, with GI nets of various stages as well as peanuts. And we do see B7X overexpression in GI nets as well. Whether you were able to look at tumors over time uh, when you were looking at um, some of the novel treatment strategies. Yeah, so that actually should be an answer uh, given by Zhi Zheng because he did look at them over time. You you took weekly uh, serum insulin levels, but yeah, usually we take the um, uh, insulin set weekly. Yeah, and then uh, but we did take terminal. I mean, when he yeah. euthanized the mice, we just have uh, an analysis of the tumors by flow cytometry or by immunohistochemistry. So that is a static single time point. We just need a lot more animals to actually yeah. do it at, at time points early. Like when they're most sensitive, do we see an even greater change? 
than at later time points, maybe when they're starting to become resistant, if they are becoming yeah. resistant. We and haven't seen it yet. Yeah, if you want to do the more mice and check the, see the, the first cycle, uh, how about the change and uh, stop the treatment and see do the, if the uh, insurance increase again, maybe we can treat the another time and see how about the resistance again or no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also maybe do more mice to see how about the survival change or, uh, yeah. Great question though. These have been exclusively on tumor cells or also on stroke cells? In the tumor cells, yeah. The P7X, especially in the surface and also in the cytoplasm. So the, maybe the P7S have a two function. In the service, they have a immunosuppressed function. In the uh, cytoplasm, maybe have an oncogenic function. It's like the PDL1. PDL1, they have a two function. PDL1 overexpression, they have two function. One, if uh, in the service, they have an immunosuppressed uh, function and block uh, interaction with the T cell. When the PDL1 uh, located in the cytoplasm, they have an oncogenic uh, function and make the tumor genesis. Yeah. A question from the chat for um, Don and Xiang. Do you see recurrence in mice treated with Palvo and anti pdl one we haven't done the experiment yet, so it's a great question, and hopefully we'll get money and support, and we'll do it. <laughs> Did you look at the combination effect in the metastasis context, or only in the pancreas and neuroendocrine tumors? Yeah. Not yet. His model develops METs, so we want to do that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but we haven't yeah, let we them not age enough. enough. So your model doesn't <laughs> develop liver MET? For the uh, MEM1P10, yeah. No? MEM1P10? Yeah, MEM10, yes, but MEM1, that's a very low percentage development uh, metastasis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Only about 10% is very low, yeah. But 80% in your uh, MEM1P10 yeah, knockout yeah. developed M1, MEM1 yeah. and P10 double knockout, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so Don, actually, actually, I have a question. Uh, I didn't get a chance to ask uh, about yours, the combination of the CD4 uh, and the 6 uh, inhibitor and the anti-PD1, uh, it's very striking. So I assume you use anti-mouse PD1, right, yes. in that model. Yeah. So did you get a chance to, 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 to check, maybe you already did that. So if you use uh, immunodeficient mice uh, with human tumor and human T cell, w were you able to recapitulate this? the similar response? Yeah, it's a great question. We haven't done that. Um, so we, yeah, it, we've get only tumor suppression in an immune deficient animal with, um, with CDK4 MEK inhibition. Uh, we haven't done anything to, uh, I guess, change the system, add in T cells, see what we get. Um, those are great questions. With the human, yeah, human. Yeah. And Brian, just a question on the B7X. Uh, those animals, the MEN1 knockout model, um, seems to go from a normal islet to a hyperplastic islet yes. to then a neoplastic islet. And I, I'm just wondering how your B7X expression changes over time because there's yeah. obvious implications for normal islets, right? With yeah, usually the, the MEN1 knockout, they get the hyperplasia at the six months and get the insonoma at the 10 to 12 months, and we, we check our the, uh, six months hyperpressure, they also increase uh, p 7 OS pressure. But it's- um, Brian, Brian, that's a great question. Um, so we don't see B7X overexpression in MEN1 knockout islets in uh, new, newborn mice, and we don't see it at three months. It's actually between three and six months that we begin to see that B7X expression. And that's actually partly what drove us to want to understand what is the pathobiology of B7X upregulation, because it's not simply MEN1 loss that drives B7X. And that's actually what eventually uh, that and data that had been published on PD1 and PDL1 with respect to HIF1 alpha um, put us in the direction of that HIF1 alpha story that as these cells become more proliferative, um, probably as the result of not only MEN1 loss, but other 
changes that occur, um, most likely epigenetic changes um, that begin to perturb, you know, the the hypoxic environment of these um, of these growing islets, uh, and that may be what then triggers B seven X expression, um, and together with other genetic changes allows them to make that transformation into, into frank neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but it's a great question, and we don't see it expressed on normal islets. We don't see it expressed on ME and one knockout islets until they get to be hyperplastic. Just to follow up on, uh, I think, some of the questions that were starting to be asked, uh, and I think I'll, I'll pose in this way, we're actually already getting questions from patients as to uh, whether CAR T therapy will be available for neuroendocrine tumors. So to answer that question, I guess the, I would pose what are the barriers um, to uh, taking the really promising preliminary data that you have and, and, and getting it into the clinic or e even in, in, in the form of just a trial? Yeah, this is some, some question we also uh, wanted uh, to answer, so just the to give some background uh, information, so, so this is uh, the CG17 CAR T cell. This uh, technology uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, has been licensed out by uh, University, University of Pennsylvania to a company to spearhead the clinical trial. And uh, I do not have uh, the, exactly the, uh, the each step, okay, uh, the information, but uh, what I can tell is uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, they are working actively to uh, get uh, FDA's approval. And uh, you, I mean, uh, at the frontier of clinical trial, or you know, that is a completely different domain from uh, lab research. Uh, each step is highly rigorously uh, regulated, and uh, there's uh, a lot with their plates. But I, as far as I know, patients are very anxious to, to move forward, and also uh, the, the companies are working very hard. Thank you. The follow-on for sort of clarification, because I do get the exact same questions in my clinic. Can you give us a sense, maybe, uh, Sinjin, about sort of that pre-IND stage and and what type of uh, path it looks like in terms of length and, and robustness for a CAR-T agent as opposed to maybe the targeted therapies that many of us are used to dealing with? The procedure-wise, so that's uh, more or less uh, similar to the, uh, the cell therapy, you know, the first the CD. Uh, 19 CAR-T uh, was uh, trialed and uh, made uh, by my colleague, uh, Carl Jung's group. And uh, more or less, so you need uh, to have the uh, GMP good uh, uh, manufacturing practice uh, like from plasmid. So plasmid you cannot uh, use for the lab made. So they have a designated uh, provider for that. So it's have the GMP certified. Then with that, you need uh, to generate uh, the lentivirus expressing your CAR-T. Also, it's another different vendor, it's not the same. So they have to be certified by, by FDA, uh, eligible for the FDA product. So they make uh, uh, that, uh, and that's uh, all detailed, uh, like uh, next gene sequence, every single nucleotide, every batch you produce, it may verify, not say, oh, you sequence in last generation, no. So then with that, it need to introduce to the, this larger, uh, tens of liters of culture and uh, to also verify copy number and uh, so all it's, it's very time consuming not only money so it's uh, the, the time activity. Um, in, in follow up to the previous question um, whether your group can analyze a single tumor response uh, to drug treatment uh, and whether you're looking at that. Well, thanks, uh, Sunita, uh, for the question. Uh, we haven't been doing that uh, as much uh, as we did in the past. I think it would be just as straightforward to sort of do what um, what Dawn was alluding to earlier, uh, and that is uh, do stage sacrifices at various time points, since a lot of what we want to look at is more the uh, immune microenvironment of these tumors than necessarily just response uh, that we'd be able to get uh, from uh, from PET CT, and so I think our plans for the future are uh, are really just broadening the number of mice we're doing uh, in these experiments, and then getting samples at various time points uh, to query changes in the immune microenvironment. 
You know, and I might add, which would include looking at the vasculature. So, I mean, we are interested in it, and we really haven't done too much. I don't know whether you did CD31 stains. Um, yeah. You think you did, but... From our mouse model. Yeah. yeah, but I think we need to do more. And, and based on your talk, I, I think understanding how good those vessels are or not, mm -hmm. I think is very important. So maybe additional collaborations looking at at your at your factors and and then looking at the integrity of the vasculature. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great that's a great point, Don. And you know, I was waiting for a question, uh, especially from this group, because uh, many of you over the years have focused on uh, various uh, anti-vascular or anti-angiogenic therapies uh, for neuroendocrine tumors, and clearly in our work with HIF one alpha. Uh, merely crossing a B7X, a uh, MEN1 knockout with a HIF1 alpha knockout and seeing a lack of tumor growth. Uh, we certainly got answers about B7X expression uh, with that model, but it's hard to tease out whether it's the loss of B7X that is leading to lack of tumor growth or if just depleting HIF1 alpha. Uh, is having uh, an effect on not driving angiogenesis in those lesions. And this is a dilemma uh, we're wrestling with right now as to how to tease out uh, those various components. Because as much as we'd like to think we can make these systems so good that we can just query a single pathway or a single factor, obviously these are multifactorial in terms of how tumor uh, growth is driven. So we're certainly interested in trying to figure out the answer to that question, is it more when you knock out HIF-1-alpha a vascular phenomenon, or is it more the driver of the expression of these checkpoint uh, inhibitors? And so, yeah, collaborations with folks that can help us try to figure out how to discern uh, the import of those two uh, factors would be great. Well, that was, a, I think, a compelling discussion. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Wonderful and, and really exciting talks. Okay.